Assassin's Creed Mirage tried to mimic almost every aspect of the first Assassin's Creed game so much that it almost lost its own identity. While it might be a great service to the old fans of the series, I believe it was a step back in almost every direction. Four months since the release of the game have passed, and now it's a great time to talk about it. Mirage was built to win the hearts of the old fans of the series back mainly by utilizing what the franchise was best known for. But did it actually implement those features properly or did it copy them at a surface level? I believe the latter to be the answer. Let me explain it in detail. Assassin's Creed Mirage began its development as an expansion for Assassin's Creed Valhalla. But it was officially confirmed by the developers at Ubisoft Bordeaux that due to the expanding scope of development, the title quickly transitioned from a Valhalla add-on to a standalone game. Mirage promised to step away from elements that some fans found annoying in the latest entries of the franchise. Elements such as role-playing, crafting, different character builds, dialogue trees, and multiple endings. Most importantly, the game promised a return to the roots of the series by putting players in the shoes of an actual assassin. The protagonist who uses a hidden blade, respects the tenets of the creed, and hunts down members of the Orders of the Ancients. After almost six years, we have finally witnessed a return to roots with a linear story progression that is focused on the famous Assassin vs. The Order War, a small-sized map, heavy focus on stealth and parkour, and all of that comes at a $50 price tag, which at first glance sounds fascinating, and to be honest, it is. But all of that comes at a price. Mirage takes players to the early 9th century and the Abbasid Caliphate. This time, however, instead of giving players access to a vast and seemingly endless land that overwhelms them with a lot of content, the developers have provided a small part of the Abbasid Caliphate, which mainly includes the round city of Baghdad and its suburbs. This reduction in size has allowed the developer to focus more on creating a city full of details with lots of parkour possibilities. Unlike the previous games in the series, Mirage tells the story of a recurring character, Basim ibn Ishaq whom we have met in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. The story is a prequel to Valhalla, therefore we already know a great deal about Basim as a character. But with all that, the writers had lots of tricks up their sleeves. The game is filled with plot twists, cool moments, and memorable dialogues that can hook you till the end, but sadly it keeps you yearning for more. The game shows Basim's transformation from a simple street thief to a master assassin in the best possible way. In fact, this is one of the few games in the series that takes the character transformation very seriously and shows us how a normal person can turn into an assassin. Mirage solves some of the plot holes about Basim as well, although some of these revelations happen in a cryptic way and requires you to discover them through the findings of dedicated fans across the internet. However, the first problem with Mirage lies deep within its story. While the story's premise might sound great, the way it is told and characters' portrayal are played. For example, players meet many characters like Roshan, Noor, Rebecca, Master Rayhan, and many others, but the game easily forgets about them. You really don't get to know that much about any of the aforementioned characters nor their fates. For example, we are introduced to Dervish at the beginning of the game as a sort of father figure for Basim. Later on, we would meet him again only to find out that he is now an ordinary vendor with no way to the store. Maybe this occurred for reasons such as budget restraints or maybe the developers wanted to avoid story fillers. Overall, I think paying more attention to the growth of the characters would have added a lot of depth to both the game and Basim's character and would make these characters' presence to feel much more than basic quest givers of any other game. Perhaps other than Roshan who has a much deeper role in parts of Basim's journey, other characters like Rebecca could become more interesting since there's already a sibling-like rivalry between her and Basim. But the game never opens it up properly. All of that applies to the villains of the game as well. Most of them are forgettable and suffer from shallow writing and this becomes more apparent as it gets harder and harder to differentiate between villains and an ordinary city guard. To put it mildly, a large part of the villains in this game are fillers. They are presented to you so you can find their chain leader, which has an actual story tied to them. The lack of memorable antagonists like Al Mualim or the Borgias is immediately felt the moment you don't know who is it you're actually fighting against. You're trying to hunt down the head of the Order of the Ancients, but the supposed main villain of this game has zero character progression and has a very short appearance as well. 
which is very weird to say the least. Other than that, some may believe that the removal of modern day story was the right decision, but I consider its absence to be the game's biggest flaw. The Assassin's Creed franchise's story had just reached a good point with Valhalla, and to abandon it in Mirage for any reason is a major mistake in my opinion. Especially since Mirage explores one of the most important characters in the franchise's history. Now that we have talked about the story, let's move on to the main part of the game, which is the gameplay. As I mentioned earlier, the game has no role-playing elements. It's an action-adventure experience with an almost linear, limited, and close progression similar to the first game in the series. Mirage offers a standard and polished experience, but it's completely reminiscent of 7th generation console games, since it does not try to bring anything new in terms of gameplay evolution or even any sort of technologies, such as better AI or improved stealth mechanics, which I don't find it okay. But remember when I said it's just a $50 game? Mirage tries to keep its similarities to the first Assassin's Creed game while also bringing some of Assassin's Creed Unity's favorite features such as flashy parkour and the return of the black box missions. For example, when it comes down to assassinations, the game offers you multiple paths for taking your target down. I truly appreciate the fact that Ubisoft Bordeaux took the time to add this feature to the game, but here's the thing. Similar to the semi-black boxy missions in Siege of Paris DLC in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, the paths and methods in which you can take your targets down are very limited. Therefore, I don't see that much of an improvement compared to the previous entry's expansion in this regard. Mirage has a massive push towards the use of stealth mechanics. The game uses features such as hiding in the crowd, eavesdropping, sitting on benches, stalking, pickpocketing, and wearing special outfits to hide in the plain sight. There are also tools that could assist your stealth playthroughs. Tools such as throwing knives, smoke bombs, traps, slip darts, and firecrackers. But the corners the developers had to cut becomes apparent once again. For example, Wearing some special outfits would allow you to hide your identity and cross in previously restricted areas, similar to Hitman games, but this cool feature fails to impress once you figure out there are only two occasions where you actually use the mechanic, and the worst part is, both of them are story related, meaning you can't repeat this action in the side content or in other places at will. Mirage abandoned the great combat system of Valhalla, which is really okay since the franchise was originally about stealth and direct combat was usually avoided. As a result, there are basically no weapon types as Basim can only carry a sword and dagger. But one thing that caught me off guard was the fact that even though there is an actual combat system in the game, although heavily watered down compared to the other entries of the series, you can basically skip them entirely using the stealth tools such as smoke bombs, which helps you to assassinate enemies without any efforts. This simply removes the risk from every encounter in the game and makes the combat system look totally redundant. Even the armor type enemies are too simple to take out and you basically don't need any specific strategy for taking down your enemies. Just use some of your tools and you can easily cheese through the entire game. Speaking of enemies, the game features only 8 different enemy types, but in reality it feels like you're fighting 2 to 3 type of different enemies, as they don't make your combat encounters hard and still attack you in turns, which ruins the game's challenge even in its hardest difficulty. This leads us to the AI section of the game, since it affects both the stealth and combat scenarios. Mirage's AI system is insufferable. The game does not create much challenge for you in either of its gameplay moments. Guards are slow to detect you, and once they detect, they will pursue you, but it's super easy to lose them. Not in a hide in the plain sight way either. They're actually not communicating properly with each other and allow you to escape easily. Unlike the first game where using the hiding spots was much harder or enemies would shoot arrows or throw rocks at you during the pursuits, they would easily allow you to escape in this game. It's also still possible to whistle and kill enemies one by one by dragging them into a blind spot. Other than enemies, the normal NPCs in the game don't do much other than standing idle in their places or doing their usual animation. Unlike in Assassin's Creed Origins, the NPCs don't have daily routine in this game, which I will actually touch upon a bit further. But one cool little detail is that when you start taking down Basim's wanted posters, NPCs might call the guards to inform them of your presence. Which makes me wonder, 
Why would guards forget about you the second you tore your wanted poster apart? These are some of the things that I wish they made adjustable difficulty parameters for so we could make the game much harder. The parkour mechanic in this game is much closer to the first and second entries of the series instead of the previous releases. There is a massive focus on city traversal and as a result you have plenty of opportunities to climb and traverse through the city. However, there's yet another disappointment occurring in this section of the game as well. There's a parkour up and down mechanic. And there are lots of planks, beams, rooftops with ledges to vaults, lifts, and other means of traversal. But there are actually little to no puzzle platforming sections. No parkour challenge like in the first game where you could capture the flags, or in the third game and Valhalla where you could pursue the flying papers. There's absolutely nothing that leverages this parkour system, but at least it's there and the developers have shown that they still care about creating a fun map for the players to explore using this cool feature. It's worth mentioning that you can leverage parkour in your self playthroughs, which helps creating some badass moments as well. It basically feels amazing to explore the world of Mirage. Baghdad is filled with life and color. Just a simple stroll through the city is enough to convince you of its beauty. The structures are mesmerizing, the atmosphere is simply astonishing, and the ambient sound further helps you to get immersed in the game. During the dawn, you always hear the sound of the morning prayer, calling citizens to pray to God. And as soon as you hear it, the game's music stops playing making the experience much more immersive. During the day, you will hear citizens chatter while the Munadi, or the Heralds, scream and inform everyone of the latest news. But one small detail that caught my attention was the lack of day and night routines for the NPCs, as I have stated earlier. Baghdad is a bustling city and it's always crowded. But technically, during the night times, streets must be emptier, with mainly guards roaming them to provide security for the citizens. Instead, everything is fixed in the game. There's always a massive group of people at every time of the day, which simply breaks the immersion of the game. There are different rewards for Basim's adventures in the city. Other than enjoying the beauty of the city and its surroundings, you can find codex files that literally teach you about the history of 9th century Baghdad and the Abbasid Caliphate. To be honest, I'm really glad that Ubisoft embraced the historical education part of the series stronger than the previous games, as it just hits different with this game compared to the last three entries. Baghdad is filled with side activities such as collecting artifacts, treasure maps, chests, mysterious shards or even lost books, each of which comes with a reward. A reward so lousy that I was truly surprised to be honest. You might spend hours looking for these collectibles and in the end, you're treated with a charm as a reward. No cutscenes, no interesting stuff that adds up to the lore or the story, nothing that actually makes them feel memorable or rewarding. Do you remember collecting 100 feathers for Ezio only to get the worst cape possible? Yeah, this is worse than that. At least the auditory cape had some meaning behind it. It's also worth mentioning that the removal of the level system has drastically helped make the exploration of the world enjoyable, as you are free to visit everywhere at your own pace without an invisible barrier stopping you because of enemy power and other nonsense like that. Overall, I think Ubisoft has made Mirage too dependent on Assassin's Creed 1 in order to show that they're loyal to the franchise. Mirage is a good fan service but it has an identity problem since it tries to be multiple other Assassin's Creed games that fans still adore. It's an enjoyable short ride that can last anywhere between 15 to 30 hours long and could be reminiscent of the good old days of the franchise for some. Sadly, the technical aspects, budget and the scope of the game didn't allow it to become its own thing. The game feels exactly like a title from the PS3 and Xbox 360 era. The shallow writing and the lacking gameplay mechanics makes the game fall a bit short in some places. Yes, it is a $50 game and we should lower our expectations, but there were so many other things the developers could do with this game to make it a different experience since it already reaches so many things that the past games did. And let's not forget how bad the navigation in the world is, since everywhere is too similar looking because of the setting and there's basically no way other than relying on the heads-up display elements to get to your objective. If you decide to turn off your HUD, 
it's practically impossible to go from one point of the town to the other with the intention of going to a specific area. Something that Assassin's Creed Valhalla did miles better. And since you're already here, you can watch the video where I explain that part about how Valhalla guides players in its world and detail from here.